Hello and welcome. Well, the relationship between parents and teachers have no doubt strengthened these last few months due to homeschooling. And it is, however, essential to continue building on these relationships to ensure that there is effective communication for a positive family school partnership for the benefits of all involved, and that being children, parents, and teachers. Now, to talk to us about this today um, and how we can formulate a relationship of trust and collaboration, we welcome back our special guest, Andrew Obertha, a primary school teacher with over 30 years experience teaching and leading uh, primary schools in Brisbane. Now, in 2018, Andrew published his first book, Are You Ready for Primary School This Year?, which is uh, about building a culture of trust, collaboration, and inquiry between parents and teachers. And what better expert do we do we have than this today as an example of someone that really knows what he's talking about? Now, it's really great to welcome you back, Andrew. How are you? I'm very well, Rachel. It's great to be here. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. We we're just talking offline about your fantastic and beautiful tan there, um, you, your brizzy tan that you have. Um, and I'm still pasty down here in Melbourne, so <laughs> sign of the times. Degrees in the first week of winter in Brisbane, Rachel. Oh, as we were just saying, in Melbourne is a, a, a tropical 13 degrees today, so you know. <laughs> Now, there's lots to talk about um, on this, and I know this is a subject that you are very passionate about, so I really want to be able to extract as much information from you as possible, always with the benefit um, of helping parents, teachers, and children um, all together. So first of all, you know, have you noticed that since children have returned back to school um, following um, homeschooling, that the relationship between parents and teachers has strengthened um, or not at all? Rachel, I think it has strengthened. I think first and foremost, there's been a greater appreciation from parents in understanding the work of teachers more and more. Yep. Even within the first week or two weeks of learning at home, the parents were commenting to me via emails or phone calls or Zoom meetings. They yep. said, now we understand parents, sorry, we understand teachers, what they go through more and more. And there's been a huge amount of appreciation. How so wonderful. when the when the parents were handing the children back just over a week ago, there was great delight on the faces of the parents to say, yes, teachers, you're the experts, great. But there was also great okay. delight on the faces of the teachers to have their kids back because that's what teachers love to do. So I think it also strengthened the relationship and the knowledge of what both parents and teachers have to do in managing their child's educational journey. We each play a part. And that's what I love to emphasise. We can't do it without each other. Parents need teachers and teachers need parents. And this experience of learning from home has just reinforced that message. Yes. And, you know, typically, I guess the relationship between parents and teachers in the past, you know, has been strained. Um, and purely just because everybody wants the, the best um, for the children, you know, parents want to safeguard their children uh, and they're naturally emotionally involved, um, you know, in, in what their children is, uh, the, the children are doing um, and teachers are just trying to do their very best. As you just said before, they love what they do. Um, so everybody's wanting the, the best for the, the benefit for the child, but these two can clash sometimes. Now, previously, what had been your experience with this? Look, Rachel, there is no doubt that Previously, schools were the domain of teachers and if a parent would come in and offer suggestions, some teachers would get rather defensive and go, but I'm the teacher, I'm the expert, and I've been doing this for a long time. Yep. I think there's been a shift in mindset from teachers and parents to understand that we need to work hand in hand together and hence there's probably been a relaxing, particularly from younger teachers, to say, no, no, parents are part of the educational journey and they need to be part of the educational journey. And some experienced teachers are also starting just to drop their walls a little bit to say, no, we will welcome the parental involvement in the children's education. Who knows a child better than their parents? Yes. But who knows teaching better than teachers? Exactly. So let's put the two hand in hand. And who's going to benefit? The child, which is the common element we both have, whose interests we have at heart. Mm -hmm. and, and, and talking more about... Um 
I guess the, the the respect that that parents um, have for teachers now. You know, parents I guess who are involved more with their child's uh, education tend to have a more positive view of teachers, um, which can improve um, in teachers' morale overall. Um, and research has actually showed that parental involvement can free teachers to focus more on the task at hand of teaching children, which is what, like we were just saying earlier on, the most important thing. So what, what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, look, Rachel, the research is very strong about that. If parents are involved in their child's education, then yeah. the kids will benefit. We have to work hand in hand. That doesn't mean that parents have to be in classrooms each and every day, mm -hmm. but it does mean parents need to support the efforts of the teacher in enhancing their child's learning journey. So make sure you read the newsletters, make sure you follow up the homework expectations, make sure the child have the resources necessary to fulfill their learning obligations at school. So if we work hand in hand, then the child will benefit. So there's no doubt the respect has increased. And I think the homeschooling experience has meant that mum and dads understand teachers more and then the teachers are understanding parents more. Mm -hmm. So I think that respect has been enhanced, but we need to work hand in hand to make sure the child benefits. But certainly there's been dropping of the walls from teachers, which is great. Wonderful. There's been also an, an acceptance that the teacher's gig is pretty tough when you've got 25 or 30 kids in front of you. So the expectations from the parents have probably become more realistic, which is excellent. Yes. Now we published your article, uh, Formula for Trust and Collaboration, three plus three plus three plus five plus two. Now, for someone, I had to read that last bit out because, because what we're about to chat about now explains it sure. all. So for someone That's who right. hasn't read the article yet, can you please give us an overview what, what it's actually about and what inspired you to write it? Sure. Look, Rach, as you mentioned, um, I'm very big about developing a culture of trust and collaboration between parents and teachers. And my experience would suggest that those numbers represent conversations and questions and dispositions that parents and teachers may have when responding to children so that children will be the beneficiaries. So mm -hmm. the article breaks down each of those numbers um, and they correspond to either questions or uh, dispositions that I'm about to elaborate with you, I hope. Yes. And let's go through all of that now. So your article explains when a child comes home from school and shares a concern with a parent, um, a parent has a choice of three responses. Um, can you please explain um, each one of them for, for us now? Absolutely. So imagine a child comes home and says to mum and dad, something's happened in the plague and I've been picked on by a child. The teacher didn't listen. Mum and dad have got three responses and how they can um, look after and care for their child. Now, the mm -hmm. first response might be to believe what the child said is gospel. Mm -hmm. And hence, the parent may choose to get very emotional, fire off an email, get on the phone, ring the principal, ring the teacher, but they're believing whatever the child said is gospel. So that's the first response. The second response might be to dismiss whatever the child said and tell the child to toughen up, be resilient, get over it and move on for the next day. But having said that, they might miss something very important for the child. So that's the second response. The third response a parent may choose is to listen to the child very carefully and cautiously and say, thank you. I'm now going to get feedback from the school because I've heard the child's point of view and a child may have filtered whatever they've said and whatever their recollections are about the event. So the parent may say, look, I'm listening to you. I'm hearing you. I'm caring and loving you but I want to get the school's opinion. So the third option is to listen cautiously and then follow up with the school. So the first two are quite negative and, and could be sort of detrimental to the child realistically. The first one is that the, the, the parent, although they, they, they take it on 100%, what, what their child has said is, is 100% accurate, by them then um, sort of, I guess, calling the school and exploding on the school is not necessarily going to be a positive outcome potentially for the child. And, and, and the second scenario also, so it's only the third scenario which is likely to have a positive outcome for the child, do you believe? Absolutely, Rachel. And I think the positive outcome will also be for the parents and the teachers by developing that culture of trust through collaboration. Because the parent is basically saying, I'm believing my child, but I also understand my child's 10 or 5 or 12, in which case they might have spun the story somehow. But I do want to believe them. But I really need to get the school's point of view before we can make an informed decision about how best to move forward collaboratively. So if the parent 
listens to their child, acknowledges what they've heard, and then says, listen, we're just going to follow up that up with the school. And I think that gives an opportunity for the teacher and the parents to move forward, understanding the child will benefit. Okay. So in this scenario where they haven't necessarily gone the first or the second, they've gone in the middle of the road and they've chosen the third. Once um, a parent does um, make an appointment to, to, to meet with someone at the school. Now, what are the three questions that a parent should ask the school then? What are they? Beautiful. The first question a parent simply has to say to the teacher or the principal, whoever's involved is, can you tell me what happened at school today? <laughs> because my child has come home and said X, and I'd just like to understand what the school's recollection is of that particular incident. So if Johnny comes home and says, I've been bullied or the teacher didn't listen to me today, the parent simply has to say to the teacher, look, this is what Johnny's reported. Can you tell me what happened at school today? Simple as that. So the parent is just asking a natural question of inquiry and the teacher doesn't have to get defensive, the teacher just has to share information with the parent. So as the teacher, I'm gonna hopefully say, well, listen, this is what I saw happen or this is how I was involved with your child. So the parent has then both teacher and child's point of view. So the first question, what happened at school today? Mm -hmm. What's the second question? So following up from that, then it's an opportunity for the parent to say to the teacher, can you help me understand what is the school's policy or protocol or process mm -hmm. about whatever the issue is? So if it's a bullying accusation or if it's an injury, if I can give you an example, if I send a child home and they have an injury and mum and dad is worried about that injury, they can contact the school and say, listen, what's the school's process or policy or protocol on following up injuries with family members. Mm -hmm. Again, a simple question of inquiry, which allows the school to explain what happened. They don't have to get defensive. They're simply, the parents are simply seeking information. So that allows the school to say, listen, our policy about sending kids home with injury is, if it's a head injury, we contact the school. If it's a minor injury where they had to get a Band-Aid, we don't contact the school. And the parent goes, okay, now I understand what the school's position is. I can move forward. Okay, sorry for asking, but I'm asking because I don't know. But what policies and procedures are mandatory for all schools to follow throughout Australia? Yeah, look, um, let me give you the three big ones that I think most schools would be very conscious of. The first one's about attendance. Mm -hmm. um, children have to attend school. Um, that's bottom line. And most schools, they may develop their own policies and procedures around contacting schools, but if a child does not attend school, uh, and is enrolled at a school, then the school has an obligation to follow up with that family. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it will be up to the school to determine how best to follow up. And if a child has significant absence, then there would be an expectation that that would be reported to the relevant education authority. So attendance is a critical one. Um, the, the other two big ones at the moment, which schools are very conscious of, is the use of internet, uh, use of technology. Um, with cyberbullying being such a prevalent problem in our schools these days and with the access to internet and social media being more of and course. more available and the use of devices for younger and younger children, um, then there are lots of policies and procedures around the use of IT in schools these days. Once again, most schools would have a policy, I hope, that rely on the collaboration and cooperation of the parents. Mm. So a lot of schools have acceptable user policies so that if we have one-to-one -one devices that children are using at home mum and dad have to help the school manage those devices so that's a key one also um, the other one that is is huge in schools is obviously child safety um, and we have mandatory reporting processes if there are any issues regarding child safety so there are numerous policies and procedures in in schools rachel but those three um, attendance is huge um, it is huge and child safety is huge and as you can see we're talking about the welfare of children. Um, that would be the overarching theme for each of those policies. Obviously, all of our schools are following the Australian curriculum. Um, that's mandated by the government and our education authority. So that's standard across the country. But those three policies, attendance, IT and child safety, I think are three key ones in our modern age. Mm -hmm. So when parents are looking to enrol their, their child into a school um, and I guess understanding what that individual school's policies and procedures are on, on top of what is mandatory um, from, the, from the government, what sort of questions do you think that they should be asking? Look, it's very common for families to ask questions around um, firstly about curriculum, what is being taught and what's the philosophy and what might be some of the pedagogies that your school will be 
Mm -hmm. um, introducing. I, I did an enrollment interview today and a family asked me that exact question. Um, what, are, what are the pedagogical practices that your teachers will be using mm -hmm. to make sure that my child gets a good education? Which is a fantastic question. They often ask questions around bullying um, because it's a very emotive term and families hear that term in the press a lot. So families of often ask questions around bullying. They often ask questions about safety. Um, for example, my school doesn't have a fence that can be locked in uh, or, or the whole children can't be enclosed. So there's lots of access to my school by virtue of being on a corner, by virtue of being next to in the middle of a neighborhood. So families often ask about those sort of safety measures. They often ask about mm -hmm. communication. How often will I expect to be communicated by my child's teacher? Um, will it only be once or twice a year or can it be as frequently as I need to communicate with my child's teacher? So they're the sorts of questions which will give parents a flavour for what the school's like because communication between home and school is key to a child's success. So if they ask those questions, it will give the parents the flavour for what the communication will be like for the school. Thank you. That's awesome. Now, we've only spoken at this stage about the first two questions that, um, yeah. that a parent should ask a, a school. Um, so what is the third question? The third question should be something along the lines of what can we, mum and dad, parents mm -hmm. and teachers do together to ensure my child's learning journey continues? Okay. So if, if I could use an example, if a child is struggling academically um, in class, and the parent goes through the first question, well, what's happening in class today? What happened with the spelling? Or what happened with my child learning their basic facts? So the teacher explains what happened at school today. And it might be a case of, well, what's the school's process or policy about teaching spelling in your child's school? So the teacher explains, we teach spelling using these methods. Okay, so the parent understands that information. So now let's focus on the child. What are we, parents and teachers, going to do to ensure my child learns their spelling properly? So we both take some responsibility. We work collaboratively and who benefits? The child. So the third question is, what will we do together to ensure my child's gonna to continue to learn? Awesome, thank you for sharing those. Um, and I guess when a parent does engage with their child's school, you know, what are the common themes or reasons why parents have to or, or choose to in engage with the school? Yeah, right, so look, my um, research through 30 years experience, as well as just tracking um, some of the, the press and some of the research into why parents do engage with school. There are some common themes mm -hmm. um, that parents often seek school's advice about. And, and I've mentioned some of them already, but IT use is one of the big ones. Um, how do parents and teachers work together to manage the IT component and, and use for a child? Yep. Because we need devices in the hands of younger and younger children and mums and dads don't often know how to manage that at home as schools are trying to navigate that journey through uh, work at home. Sure. The other one is, how do we live a healthy lifestyle? So let me suggest that mum and dad provide lunches for children, but schools provide tuck shops and canteens. So how do we provide a healthy lifestyle for our children? You'll notice that some of these themes bridge both environments because there's responsibility on school and there's responsibility on home. So we're just reinforcing that message of collaboration and hence we've got to work together. So healthy living is a, is a common one. Uh, IT is a common one. Homework is another emotional topic which parents and teachers often have to talk about. Um, there is great research to question the value of homework in primary schools um, without getting into the do's or don'ts about homework. Let me assure you that every child should be reading every day. Uh, but homework is another common theme that families certainly engage with. Communication generally is another common theme that parents need to feel comfortable about. Methods of communication, what we're communicating about, frequency of communication. That's another important theme that parents and teachers need to get on the same page about. If parents have unrealistic expectations about the degree of communication, then they're going to get very frustrated. And the communication will vary from the youngest children through the eldest child. So what happens in kindy and prep may not happen in grade six, grade seven, and in, when you get into high school. So communication is another key theme that parents and teachers need to get on the same page about. Mm -hmm. 
Um, there's something I just want to bring up, which is always a very difficult subject to, to discuss, which is, I guess, about domestic violence um, in, in the yeah. home and those types of things as well. And there's been a lot um, said, and we've done quite a few interviews on that um, during sort of the lockdown period, knowing that teachers and educators have, have got a, a responsibility to report on things um, as they are seen um, with with children um, and anything that they may suspect as well. Um, is this something that um, that in general the parents are, 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 um, in instance where maybe their child and an educator has maybe su suspected that there, there may be some violence or something in the, in the home are the parents are directly contacted or, or what generally happens with this sort of scenario? Yeah, look, Rachel, that's a really sensitive topic for school leaders to navigate through. Very difficult. My, it, it's really tough. Yeah, look, and my experience would suggest it depends on the relationship you have with the families. Mm. So if I have a, a, a good relationship with some parents and I know the family well, then it would be a difficult but sensitive and necessary conversation to say, you know, I've noticed some things or I've noticed a change in your child. Is everything okay at home? Um, if, if a partner comes to me and expresses some concerns, that becomes more difficult because then going to the, the other party um, is probably beyond my scope of work. Having said that, I've, my responsibility is to ensure the safety of the child. If a parent isn't safe, then it's difficult for the child to be safe. So we often get advice from our child protection authorities. Um, I have personally phoned police and asked police for advice just to follow up and to see what is possible. It is a really difficult and sensitive topic, but we have to keep in mind, whatever we do, we're acting in the best interests of and safety of the child. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess going back to some of the other subjects we were saying before that were a little bit more lighthearted in general, you know, why is it important that parents know when they are going to engage um, with the school to understand why they are actually sort of um, wanting to contact the school and discuss a topic yeah. or issue. Rachel, it just makes it so much easier if the parents are clear as to why they're coming to school, which sure. it, it, it actually allows the teacher to address their reasons. Mm -hmm. So this is probably a great segue into the questions that teachers may ask parents. Would that help? Oh, a hundred percent. So imagine a parent comes to a school and explains an issue that's worrying them or they're coming to school for a variety of reasons, which we'll talk about in a moment. But the first question a teacher can ask the parent is, what do you need? Now that question seems really basic, but it's really disarming for a parent to hear that. And when I've asked parent that question, they sort of sit back and go, you're asking me for an opinion about what I'm after. And I'm exactly. Which means the parent has to be clear about why they're there. Yes. I'm going to talk to you in a moment about the five reasons why parents come to school. But when a teacher says to a parent, what do you need? And if they say it in a genuine, compassionate, inquisitive way, then it allows the parent to explain to the teacher, look, I'm coming here in the best interest of my child. I just need to understand such and such. Or they might come for another reason. And we're going to explain those five reasons in a moment. But the first question is, what do you need? Mm -hmm. And it's really, it empowers the parents. It makes them feel good. It also disarms them because they're going, you're valuing my opinion. That's fantastic. Yes. You want, you want to know. That yep. Yes, exactly. Which helps build that relationship, which is great. Just, can I go on to the second question? Please do. <laughs> the second question that a teacher should then follow up with is, what do you think, whatever the parent's asking for, hmm. would look like in my class or my school? So they get to so see it from the teacher's point of view now, don't they? Bingo, Rachel. Perfect. And by doing that, they get to stand in the shoes of the teacher and go, listen, I'm really expecting this from you. And then the teacher goes, okay, well, just let's talk through. What would that look like in my classroom? Can I give you an example? True story. I had a parent come to me once and say, Andrew, I would like daily written feedback about my child's progress on every subject. It's a bit unrealistic, is it? And I just, well, exactly. And I just said to the parent, I said, okay, so what do you need? And they said, I want daily written feedback about my child's progress on every subject. And I said, okay. I said, what do you think that would look like in my classroom? And you could just see the wheels ticking over. And the parents going, well, hang on, Andrew's teaching 25 kids or 30 kids. And I'm asking this. And if every parent asks that, that's not going to happen. So I went back to my first question. I said, what do you need again? 
and they said, look, we just need regular updates on my child's progress. I went, fantastic, I can provide that for you. But by having them ask the question or answer the question, what's it gonna look like in my classroom? They were being self-reflective to say, listen, is this actually possible and is it realistic and is this gonna happen? Mm -hmm. Which we're gonna talk about in a moment. But by having them stand in the shoes of the teacher was just fantastic. So they then by default went, well, actually what I need is not daily written feedback about each subject. What I need is regular updates about my child's progress. Yep. Very different, same outcome. Yes. What's the third? So the third question is simply to close a conversation between parents and teachers and the teacher just needs to ensure that the parent has said all they need to say. So the final question is, is there anything else I can help you with before we move on? So it just gives again the parent the opportunity to reflect, have I said everything I want to say? Has the teacher heard me and responded? Yes. Have I got answers? Yes. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we close? Thinking time, reflection time. No, no, I'm all good. So if the teacher asks those three questions, what do you need? What's it look like in my classroom or school, do you think? And is there anything else? Mm -hmm. 99% of scenarios that parents present to teachers can be addressed by those three simple questions. So this last question really simply gives the parents the chance to reflect um, and ensure that their needs have been met by both parties. And so they can walk away content that they've actually been heard. And I guess it's also a, a simple technique which allows teachers to close off the conversation and that al allows the parents to have some closure, would you say? Absolutely, right. So you've summed it up perfectly. Spot on. Yeah. And, and is this a technique that you've used, I guess, I mean, no doubt, right throughout sort of the last 30 years as well? I'd love to say it's been 30 years, Rachel. It's been more like the last few years. It, it's taken me a while to, to refine some of these conversation skills with parents over a long time. But I think schools have had a habit of developing lots of policies and frameworks and protocols, which are very complex and complicated. Mm -hmm. um, if we break down the communication process into very simple bite-sized pieces it allows the staff to get their needs met it allows the needs of the parents to be met and who benefits the child so i think we need to streamline our communication processes so that we get on the same page very quickly and what are we creating a culture of trust and collaboration and how did you actually get to the point when you, you realized that it was this easy because when you're breaking it down, I know we're about to sort of go into another five things now, which is really, it's, it's, it's wonderfully broken down. But how did, you, how did you get to this point over like, throughout your career so far? Yeah, look, I, I was fortunate to do some study in, in 2016 and I did some study around negotiation. And I was fortunate to study under a very wise gentleman called Alan Parker. And Alan gave me some very simple frameworks about the way, to, way we can communicate with people. Uh, we don't necessarily have to overcomplicate things and we don't have to catastrophize things. We have to deal with the emotion of people, granted, but I think if we can deal in facts and how do we get facts is by asking very simple, specific questions um, and it allows people to respond. So it took me a long time and I wouldn't have probably been this polished if I was a first year teacher and hopefully what I'm offering now, people can apply to their classroom settings and school settings. So we create that culture of trust and collaboration. Fantastic. Now, so we've done the three, the three and the three. Now we're up to the five. So you mentioned in the article that when a parent goes to their child's school, they usually approach the teacher or the principal for one of uh, five reasons. So can you explain what one of these or each of these five reasons are? Sure, absolutely. Right. So the first reason a parent might go to school is simply to share information. Um, and I'll try and give an example, if you like, about what this may look like. If that's okay. Great. Um, so let me give you an example of sharing information. Um, my child has been sick for the last few days. They're now back at school. Here's some medication. They're simply sharing information. That's all they're doing. They're coming to school, they're handing their child back and they're sharing information. That's the first and, and probably the easiest reasons why parents engage with school. So mm -hmm. that's pretty straightforward. And I'll, let me give you the second reason why parents engage with school. Mm -hmm. It might be to seek information or context or history. Now, let me give you an example about that. Um, family might be new to the school and they might look at the tuck shop menu or the canteen menu and go, gee, I really want to make some suggestions about that. But before I do, I'm just going to go to the school and understand what the history of the context is. So they go to the tuck shop convenient or they go to the PNF or PNC president and say, 
how long is the Tuxot menu been in place for? So they're simply seeking understanding, seeking history, seeking context. So yep. that'll be the second reason families can come to school. So they're just seeking information, gathering information, which is great. The third reason why families might go to school would be to ask the school for a resolution to a problem. One of my favourite examples about this one is the car park and the drop-off and pick-up <laughs> routine. So parents come to the principal and say, you've got to fix the car park routine. You've got to fix the <laughs> I think you should I'm do like this. Good. Yes. Yes, this is exactly. my opinion. I want to be heard. <laughs> ah, that's one of the other ones, Rachel. But this this reason it might be to come and say, "Listen, I, this, you've got to fix this problem. The car park is inefficient. I'm late for work every day. I'm late for school. Can you please fix the problem?" <laughs> so the reason is they want a solution. They go to school seeking a solution. That's the third reason. The fourth reason associated with this one, the fourth reason is to offer a solution. Now, actually, I love parents who come and give me a solution. Not all principals and not all teachers like these parents because they're thinking, hang on, this is my classroom. School is my domain. Yes. I know how to run this. But let's be honest, I'm not a civil engineer. I missed that lesson in principal school. So if I've got a civil engineer in the parent body and they come to me and say, Andrew, look, I've had a look at the car park. I know it's a bit of a problem. Do you mind if I offer you a suggestion? That's fantastic. I'll work hand in hand with any parent who's an expert. Similarly, if I've got a parent who's an architect in the community and they can see that I'm going to remodel a classroom and they can say, Andrew, I've got some ideas for you. I will take parents' suggestions on board 100%. So the fourth reason is that they can offer a solution, which is great. They've got expertise. I don't. Let's use their expertise. Yes. And the fifth and final reason why parents come to school may be to get advice. Let me give you a classic example about this one. Children who are using the internet at home and mum and dad don't know how to manage the internet use at home. So they come to school and even though school is the teacher's domain and our circle of influence is at school, it's not uncommon for parents to come to teachers and say, listen, I don't know how to stop my child playing Fortnite for three hours a day. What do you suggest? Yes. Or, I don't know how, how to get my child to do more homework. What do you suggest? Or I don't know how to get my child to go and do some exercise and run around the yard when all they want to do is be a bookworm. What do you suggest? So parents come to school to seek advice and wisdom off the teacher, off the principal. So they're the five reasons why parents come to school. If I could just go through them once more, just to let me summarize yes. them for you. Yeah. They come to share information, simply to give the school information. Yep. That's one. They come to seek in understanding information or context or history. Yes. So understanding what happens beforehand. They come along to ask for a resolution or a solution. There's been a problem and you've got to fix it, principal or teacher, so please do that. The other one might be for them to offer a resolution or a solution because they have expertise, which is great. And the fifth reason is to seek advice. They want assistance. They want, to, they want someone else to give them some ideas about what to do. So they ask for assistance. So those five reasons I would suggest would cover 99.9% .9 of reasons why parents come to school. They're beautifully broken down too. You make it sound so simple when you do it like this. Oh. <laughs> oh. 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 <laughs> now, lastly, you know, you mentioned in the article, when teachers respond to any parent request, the teacher should filter their responses um, with one or two criteria. So can you explain what those two are, please? Yeah, absolutely. Rachel, when a parent comes to school, if I can go back to my example about the parent asking for daily written feedback so on their what child's program. So I'm at the moment, just wanting a bit of attention. <laughs> sorry, Andrew. <laughs> sorry, right. yes, sorry, continue. So if a parent comes and says, look, I want daily written feedback about my child's progress. If I was a teacher getting that message, the two criteria I'm filtering my response with is, is this realistic? Can I actually commit to doing this? That's the first thing. So is it realistic that I'm going to give data written feedback to this parent about this child's educational journey? And the second criteria is, is it sustainable? Can I do it on an ongoing basis over and over and over again? I can probably give data written feedback once before I get exhausted and go, hang on, I've got 26 other kids I've got to <laughs> So the first question is, is it realistic? Yeah. And the second criteria is, is it sustainable? And if a teacher can confidently in their mind say, yeah, a, I can do that, and B, I can keep doing it, 
then I think they're on to a strategy which will be possible for them and for the parents. Well, look, you've given us some really great advice today and, and some really helpful approaches in which schools and parents can communicate and interact, um, you know, positively or with the view of, um, you know, improving um, children's education. If you were to, I guess, to summarise everything that we've spoken about today, um, which there's, there's, as I said, there's so much information, but how would you, I guess, to summarise what your key messages are? Yeah, Rachel, people get tired of me saying these words, but it's trust and collaboration and through inquiry. So let's ask yes. the right question in the context. We build that relationship between parents and teachers. We each take responsibility knowing that the common element is the child that we know and love and care for as we're working on this educational journey together. So let's build that culture of trust and collaboration. Yeah, wonderful. And if parents have got any other questions for you, whereabouts can they find you? Look, my website is www.creativecollaborativesolutions.net. Look me up. I'm happy to address any questions. Wonderful. And we'll have a link to the article in the show notes because um, all of these things are broken down even more so with more information. So thank you. And thank you for making it so easy um, and, and digestible, I think, because as, as you said, this, is, this has been um, a labour of love for you and, and, and getting to the point of understanding what are these common um, things and seeing it from both sides as well, um, seeing it both from parents and from, for, from the teacher's point of view. So thank you so much for sharing them with us today. But um, we'll look forward to chatting with you again soon. Take care, Andrew. Thanks again. Pleasure, Rachel. Good to see you. All the best. Okay. Cheers. Okay, bye.